The Secret of Ireland's Eye by Fiona Daly is the final drama documentary in the series about true Irish murder stories. Now, thou shalt not kill. This is the National Library of Ireland in Dublin, founded during the reign of Queen Victoria in 1877. And apart from the wealth of books, manuscripts, and newspapers, which form the source material for Irish scholars, it contains also some less well-known, but no less surprising treasures. One of these is a portfolio containing the paintings and drawings of a Victorian gentleman, a professional painter. Great. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. William Burke Kirwan was an artist in the 1800s, and this collection of his work may help to solve a mystery which has caused bitter controversy for 140 years and continues to intrigue even today. Though known mainly as a miniaturist painting portraits on commission, Kerwin would turn his hand to almost anything. What we have in our folio of William Burke Irwin's work is a lot of what seems to me preparatory work for perhaps oil paintings which would have been sold, as well as his um, draft work for uh, lithographs and for engravings. So I think he would have made a pretty good income. Um, he, he was obviously trying to be as broad-ranging as possible, and his interests seem to have been broad-ranging. I'm not quite sure whether it was because of a commercial need, of an economic need, or whether his interests, in fact, were quite broad-ranging. But he does seem to have been able to command so, uh, quite a sum of money, I, I can guess, from his range of activities. Kirwan was a regular exhibitor at the Royal Irish Academy, and his work would certainly have been in demand. He had his home at number 11 Merrion Street, a fashionable address near Merrion Square. Here he lived in modest splendor with his wife Maria, the daughter of a retired army officer. It was said that although she appeared well enough, Maria did not enjoy the best of health. Although Kirwan was a Protestant and Maria a Catholic, an unusual enough arrangement for the times, theirs appeared to be a stable and contented relationship. They'd been married for 12 years. However, they'd not been blessed with children.
In the summer of 1852, the couple came to stay in the picturesque fishing village of Hoth, eight miles outside Dublin. They arrived in July and took furnished rooms with a Mrs. Campbell with the intention of staying for several months. Mr. Doyle, will you bring the luggage around the back, please? Very well, Mrs. Good. Campbell. Yes, Kirwan is known to have made several excursions to various parts of Ireland to paint and draw. So Hoth for him was as much a working holiday as anything else. By nature, Kirwan was industrious, but something of a loner, and painting suited his temperament. However, in his relations with people, it was said of him that he was arrogant and argumentative. And while in Hoth, he had at least one altercation with the local parish priest, Father Hall. Thank you, Mrs. Ah, I see you have your Bible with you, Father Hall. That's what you people need to do, concentrate on the Bible. All the answers are in there, Father. They're all in there. Good day to you, sir. His abrasive manner and a certain reputation for meanness in his dealings did not endear Kirwan to the local people. Ah, Mr. Nangle, mm -hmm. we'll be needing you and your boat to take us over to Ireland's Eye this morning. What time? Oh, uh, shall we say 10 o'clock, if that's you can. Wait, sir. Good day, people. Ireland's Eye is a small island just half a mile off the coast of Hoth. It has a Martello Tower, a fine stretch of beach, and a beautiful view of Dublin Bay. To this day, it's a popular destination for day trippers. On the morning of Monday, the 6th of September, 1852, at 10 o'clock, Maria and William Kirwan set out on the short boat trip to the island. Kirwan had engaged Patrick Nangle, a local fisherman, to take them across. Patrick had brought his cousin Michael Nangle along to help with the rowing. The Kirwans planned to spend the day on the island and the Nangles would take them off at eight o'clock that evening. Marie and her husband seemed to have passed the morning pleasantly enough, according to another couple, the Brews, who saw them lunching in the vicinity of the Martello Tower. The Brews left in the afternoon. The Kirwins were now alone on the island. It seems that Maria went bathing a short time later. William started work on a watercolour. The Nangles arrived to pick up the couple at eight o'clock that evening. They were surprised to find Kirwan alone. His wife had not returned from her bathing, he told them, and he'd failed to find her. He was unfamiliar with the terrain, and he asked for their help in a search for her. For an hour and a half, in the failing light, they searched. 
As night fell, Patrick Nangle reached a cove known locally as Long Hole. She's here! There in the shallows lay the dead body of Maria Kirwan. Word of the tragedy spread quickly when they reached the mainland. And as the sad procession made its way down the main street of Hoth, the first shadow of a suspicion was cast. Sergeant. Good night, brother. I'd keep an eye on that man. Thank you, brother. When it was suggested to Kirwan that the police should see the body before it was laid out and prepared, Kirwan had said, I don't care a damn for the police. The body must be washed. Outside, the Nangles waited to be paid for their services. The Hoth Constabulary summoned the coroner, Henry Davis, the following morning. Davis engaged a medical student, James Hamilton, to assist him. Hamilton had observed unbloodstained froth in the mouth of the victim, a sign of drowning. The abrasions to the face he put down to the activity of green crabs and to the pull of the tide on the body as it lay on the rocks. He could find no evidence of violence. I think we can say it's a case of accidental drowning, Mr. Davis. I don't see any indications to the contrary. Very well, Mr. Hamilton. Davis had been a coroner for 10 years and well used to examining victims of drowning in Hoth, and he agreed with the younger man's conclusions that Maria Kirwan had drowned. An inquest was called for that afternoon. There were six witnesses, including Hamilton. I am confident that my conclusion is correct. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Patrick Nangle, please. But it was Patrick Nangle's account of the circumstances of finding the body that proved most controversial. As I said to you, sir, I saw the body. I went over to her. She was dead. She was lying on a sheet. No, sir. It was the gentleman brought the sheet. The fellow is astray. This man has the true way of it. Order, please. Kerwin had sent Patrick to fetch his wife's clothing, but when he failed to find them, Kerwin himself took up the search. Michael Nangle, Patrick's cousin, maintained that when Kerwin returned with his wife's clothes, he brought with him a bath sheet or towel, as we would call it today. Patrick's version, however, was that the body was lying on the bath sheet when he found it, which would not make sense if Maria had drowned while bathing. Eventually, Patrick admitted that he may have been mistaken. The jury was unanimous. Your verdict is that Mrs. Maria Kerwin died as a result of accidental drowning. Is that the verdict of you all? It is, sir. 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this court is adjourned. With this clear verdict, one would have expected sympathy for Kerwin, a grieving widower. But there were some who were less than happy with the verdict that day. I'll pinch that fella, yeah. The following day, Kerwin set and trained the arrangements to bury his wife. But when he attempted to leave with the body, the Nangos and the women who laid out the body were waiting. You haven't settled up Russia, Mr. Kerwin. They claimed that they had not been adequately compensated for their services. Kirwan had few friends when he left Hoth that night. Five days later, Maria Kirwan was buried here in Glasnevin Cemetery. But that was far from the end of the matter. In Hoth, Gossip began to circulate that the death had not been accidental. Certainly, Kirwan's unpopularity with the locals may have fueled the rumors. People talked of hearing terrible screams coming from the island on the evening of Maria's death. Maria's ghost was said to be appearing on the island, wringing its hands and moaning. Patrick Nangle's story now took on outrageous proportions. Kirwan had a sword stick and had driven it through his wife. And when they weren't fighting, they weren't talking to each other. Even Mrs. Campbell told of terrible rows and how Kirwan had struck his wife, and she was not slow to voice her suspicions. Because all his pants was wet that evening when he came in. I never liked him at all. Didn't you? No. Really? Yeah. They never got on. Good day, ladies. Good day, Father Horse. Meanwhile, back in Dublin, a former neighbour of the Kirwans had read of the inquest with more than a passing interest. Mrs. Maria Byrne, a widow, hated Kirwan, or Bloody Billy, as she used to call him, and on reading of Maria's death, she immediately claimed to have known that the young woman would not return from Hoth alive. My name is Mrs. Byrne. On September the 9th, Mrs. Byrne visited the coroner. She told him that she was gravely suspicious of Kirwan and claimed that he had tried to poison his wife on two previous occasions. But perhaps more damning than that in Victorian Ireland were her disclosures about his unconventional lifestyle. Within weeks of Maria's death, Teresa Kenny, the daughter of a Dublin printer, seemed to have moved into his Merrion Street home. What was even more extraordinary was that he was the father of her eight children. In fact, his liaison with Teresa Kenny had been going on for some 14 years. Kirwan had been leading a double life, somehow skillfully managing to divide his time between two households. Victorian Dublin, then the second city of the empire, loved a scandal, and rumours about Kirwan grew and abounded. God knows where they came from, but they seem to suggest that he was involved in two other murders. The first of these, a former colleague who had, in actual fact, died of a heart attack. The second murder was supposed to have been of Kirwan's brother-in-law, but he, in truth, had emigrated to the United States, from which he continued to send letters to his mother. But the rumors persisted. In those days, there were no screaming tabloids, but the invective of assumed guilt could just as easily be spread on street corners and coffee houses. 30 days after Maria's death, these rumors led the authorities into taking action. They ordered that the body be exhumed for post-mortem examination, and this was carried out by a Dr. Hatchell.
he concluded that Maria had not drowned at all. She had been suffocated. With this new medical evidence, the authorities took action. A warrant was issued and William Kerwin was arrested for the murder of his wife. The jurors of Our Lady the Queen do say that William Burke Kerwin, gentlemen, on the sixth day of September, in the 16th year of the reign of our sovereign lady, Queen Victoria, at Ireland's Eye, in the county of Dublin, did willfully kill and murder one Maria Louisa Kerwin. How say you? Are you guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. The trial began here at Green Street Courthouse on December the 8th, 1852. The prosecution case was stark and simple. It was that Kirwan was a man trapped in a marriage to a woman with whom he was no longer in love. It suggested that she had just discovered his long liaison with Teresa Kenny. But much of the evidence, apart from that of Dr. Hatchell and his opinion of death by suffocation, was purely circumstantial. The prosecution would suggest that Kirwan had taken his wife to Ireland's Eye with the express purpose of doing away with her. For this, the Crown would rely on the evidence of Patrick Nangle that Maria's body was found lying on a sheet which the prosecution would suggest was used to suffocate the unfortunate woman. And they would produce the testimony of witnesses who had heard screams coming from the island at seven o'clock that evening. The defence relied heavily on its medical witnesses as due to the laws of those days, an accused man wasn't allowed to give evidence on his own behalf. Kirwan was represented by Isaac Butt QC, then the leading advocate at the Irish Bar. And he suggested that the medical evidence showed that Maria had drowned, either while having a fit caused by eating and then going swimming, or by epilepsy. Maria was apparently prone to such fits although no evidence of this was tendered at the trial. And he also challenged the suggestion that Kirwan's affair had just been discovered by Maria. The late lady was well aware of this unfortunate connection and they were reconciled, he told the jury. As for the screams, they were Kirwan's own as he desperately searched for his wife. The jury, however, was not convinced. Gentlemen of the jury, you say that William Burke Kerwin is guilty of murder as charged, and is that the verdict of you all? It is. The trial had lasted two days. So on the doubtful evidence of a post-mortem and some very doubtful witnesses, a defense which failed to produce sufficient evidence of Maria's epilepsy, Kerwin was convicted of his wife's murder and was sentenced to death. And my reading of the trial is that uh, the jury were not unanimous at an early stage and that they, after all, asked for a review of some of the medical evidence. They asked for Dr. Hatchell, I think, to be recalled uh, and this was denied them. Uh, the judge, although he had allowed them a hotel on the first night of the trial, on the second night he detained them in the jury room, past one in the morning, and said he wouldn't let them out until they gave him a verdict. This would not be tolerated in the present time. The case that was made against him was first of all peculiar in that no specific case was stated by the Crown at the outset. The case did not allege a manner in which the murder had taken place. The general evidence also appears to have been very weak. The evidence that was called was all of the view that there was, the body showed no sign of an assault or any violent interference. The Crown's doctor concluded that the body had an appearance 
that was consistent with asphyxiation, but never explained the signs that he found that we, he would say would be consistent with asphyxiation, but not say consistent with drowning. The case was opened on the basis that the Mrs. Carwin, Mrs. Carwin, the wife of the accused, had recently become aware of the presence of Mr. Carwin's mistress and vice versa, but no evidence was led on that. And in fact, there would seem to have been a lot of evidence available to the Crown before the start of the case that, that just was not so. The, the, on my reading of the papers, it seems to have been a very peculiar conviction and a very perverse conviction. And I know that the authors at the time and the commentators at the time certainly thought that he was tried and convicted as much as a result of prejudice in relation to having a mistress and in, in relation to rumours that had gone around before the trial than as a result of any evidence that was adduced at the trial. Jurymen then were ratepayers of a minimal valuation. They were solidly middle class. Uh, Kerwin, uh, Dr. Connolly informs me, was uh, a, a new entity, a middle-class murderer. Prior to then, murderers in the Irish scene were either political uh, or were impoverished robbers of one kind or another. So here was a highly respectable man committing murder. And so here was a highly respectable middle-class jury being very censorious. This is the moral point. And they didn't seem all that interested in the evidence, which, after all, was very poor in terms of violence. And yet they convicted. So perhaps he was morally convicted. The execution date was fixed for January the 18th, 1853. Kerwin continued to maintain his innocence. But as there was no court of criminal appeal in those days, his only hope was that the Lord Lieutenant, who lived here in what was then the Viceregal Lodge, now Ars Nuteron, that the Lord Lieutenant would be able to exercise his prerogative of mercy and either commute his sentence or pardon him. Things looked bleak for Kerwin. The date for his hanging was set. All he could do was wait. But he was not without his supporters. Alexander Boyd, foreman of the Hoth inquest jury, was convinced that Kerwin was innocent. So he began a campaign to gather new evidence to secure Kerwin a pardon. He was tireless in his efforts and even conducted tests to see if the sound of screams would carry from the island to Hoth. The only sound that carried was the sound of seagulls. A crucial element of the prosecution case rested on when Maria Kerwin had learned of her husband's liaison with Teresa Kenny. Six months before her death, Maria's mother, Mrs. Crow, discovered Teresa's address and encouraged her daughter to confront the other woman. I would like to speak to my husband, Mr. Kerwin. I'm afraid Mr. Kerwin isn't at home. It was the first and only time that the two women had met. Mrs. Crow, however, told Boyd that her daughter had known for a long time of the relationship and had grown to live with it, accepting her husband's need for children. She added that apart from this extraordinary domestic arrangement, William was a kind and considerate husband. This evidence had not been presented at the trial. The case attracted huge public interest, not only here, but in England. The letters page of the London Times was full of correspondence on the case, and there were some strange suggestions as to how Maria might have died. One, that she had been attacked by a seal, had taken fright and drowned. Public meetings were held in support of Kirwan. In London, the case had come to the attention of Alfred Swain Taylor, one of the founders of modern forensic medicine. His book on the subject, now in its 28th edition, is used to this day. Taylor was far from convinced by Dr. Hatchell's post-mortem. 
The body had lain in a waterlogged grave for a month, so Hatchell's conclusion that Mrs. Kirwan's death was by suffocation, Taylor found hard to believe. It was before the era of rubber gloves. I'm sure the body was smelly, and I have a shrewd suspicion that Dr. Hatchell had that body opened for him. He never touched anything. It's all what he saw and the arguments about that. And he would therefore have missed and he was probably unaware of what we call emphysema aquosum, or the watery air trapping of the typical classically drowned lung. So there, of course, is the huge air of doubt about this whole case. And I think the vindication of William Burke Kerwin must lie in the area of the old Scottish verdict, not proven. Taylor favoured the inquest verdict of accidental drowning. The leading forensic pathologist of his day, his opinion could carry considerable weight. He decided to publish a pamphlet. Taylor says, I beg to submit that the appearances in the body did not justify the inferences drawn, that these appearances failed to prove that the deceased died a violent death, and that they are quite reconcilable with the view that the deceased died while in the water from a sudden attack of apoplexy or epilepsy. If it was known that she had epilepsy, if this was definitely known and she was found in such circumstances that the uh, possibility that she had had a seizure while bathing and had drowned as a result would, would be uh, very uh, great indeed. It seemed to me that that would be the, more, the most probable explanation unless one had overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And there was substantial evidence that Maria did indeed suffer from epilepsy. Alexander Boyd uncovered witnesses who could testify to Maria's fits. A friend of Maria's, Mrs. Bentley, had been present on one occasion and described graphically what bore all the marks of an epileptic fit. And other acquaintances and servants had witnessed similar incidents. None of this evidence was presented at the trial. Well, it does sound as if she may have been subject to epilepsy. Um, and, of course, uh, uh, it is uh, a general rule that anybody suffering from epilepsy shouldn't go swimming alone, because um, if a fish uh, happened, uh, it could well lead to drowning. The, the question of fits was just put up as an alternative suggestion, and nobody seems to have ruled it out. Now, the modern law in relation to a matter of that sort is that if you're trying to convict a person of a crime on circumstantial evidence, you must deduce evidence that is consistent only with guilt in relation to the charge. And if it admits to any reasonable hypothesis inconsistent with guilt, then it carries no weight. It's very hard to know, as I say, why there was a conviction in this case when all of the medical evidence left open the possibility and the defence doctor say the probability that this was a woman who'd died as a result of taking a fit in the water or alternatively perhaps died just of a drowning accident. Boyd also highlighted a serious discrepancy in the evidence. Patrick Nangle had stated that the bath sheet with which the prosecution said Kirwan had suffocated his wife was found under her body. It was the gentleman brought the sheet. At the inquest, this had been emphatically refuted by his cousin, Michael Nangle. But at the trial, Michael withdrew this evidence, saying he couldn't remember anything about a bath sheet. There certainly was a lot of people who expressed grave disquiet, and even the coroner who had carried out the, the inquest on the body came forward to explain about the discrepancy between the Nangle evidence, the change of evidence there. Other people came forward to establish that this apparently had been a very happy marriage rather than an acrimonious and a brutal one, as rumour had alleged. On New Year's Eve, 1852, the diligence and persistence of Boyd, Taylor and Kirwan's supporters prevailed. Kirwan was not pardoned, but on the advice of Judge Crampton, who had originally heard the case, Kirwan's death sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. Crampton admitted that had all this new evidence been put before the jury, the verdict might have been different.
Kerwin served the bulk of his sentence on another island, Spike Island. He was not the only one to suffer. The fallen woman, Teresa Kenny, was hounded from lodging house to lodging house by heartless landlords. Finally, defeated, she packed her belongings and took her family by steamer to a new life in America. In 1979, Kirwan was released on grounds of ill health. He had served 27 years on Spike Island. According to contemporary reports, he appeared frail and had a long white beard. He did not stay in Ireland, but took a boat from Queenstown, now Cove, and joined Teresa in the new world. The mystery of what really happened on Ireland's Eye on that September day in 1852 remains unsolved. Some people will tell you that you can read an artist's mind through his paintings. Well, if that's so, perhaps we should examine this watercolor. It's believed to be the very one that Kirwan was painting on the day Maria died. The work of a murderer, or perhaps an innocent man. died a few years later in the bosom of his family, taking the secret of Ireland's eye with him forever. Thou Shalt Not Kill, a book based on this television series, is now available from bookshops nationwide.